Okay, our next presenter, if I can do this, is Teresa Conley. She is from Region 4. Um, she's the Regional Transit Coordinator, and I want to give a shout out to Teresa because there's a transit conference going on on the coast, is that right? Yes, Some, exactly. Okay, and she volunteered to come to our workshop in order to talk about this, so really appreciate it, Teresa. This is important. I wanted Welcome. to be here. Thank you for having and me. And thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so I thought, well, first I should figure out how this thing works. I thought I'd start with something different. You know when you're trying to do something on your computer, pay an important bill or something, and it wants to make sure you're not a robot? So um, here's a little catch spot, I think that's what you call them, for transit. So select all the photos with transit components. And because it's 4 o'clock, 4.30, I'm going to give you the answers. Um, all of them, surprise, surprise. Yeah, so the bottom one, that's the construction of the Dallas Transit Center, funded, I, I think, through Enhance a while back. And then to the other side is the Redmond Hub. And you're probably thinking, what's a bridge doing on there? I'm pretty sure buses don't stop on bridges. Well, there's a route, a bi-state route, that um, crosses the 197 bridge. And so if that bridge was closed for some reason, that would impact that route, and they would have to go um, quite a ways out of the way. So there's a transit nexus there. So my point here is just kind of get the wheels turning about different um, ways that your projects can influence transit and um, lead into our, our conversation about how transit can be a resource for you, similar to um, Jessica's conversation earlier. So, also similar to Jessica's conversation, I swear we didn't coordinate, um, but why care about transit? What can we bring to the table? How can we be a resource? And then getting down to the nuts and bolts a little bit, um, how can we be a resource in your, the delivery of your projects? And then I'll summarize some key takeaways. So why care about transit? Well, we support 129 transit providers, and I'm talking about the Rail and Public Transit Division around the state, and that includes 15, 15 transit districts, 33 cities or counties that actually provide transit service directly. We work with nine tribes that either provide service directly or contract with a local provider to pro provide service. And then also currently 24 nonprofits that provide a lot of the dollar ride service you see out there. Also, we work with 14 private companies that provide some contracted or direct um, inner city service. We oversee a large fleet of about 2,000 vehicles. Half of them are funded through the Rail and Public Transit Division, and we hold the titles to those vehicles. And we, from afar, manage and make sure they're in good condition um, and provide funding to keep them in good condition. And annually, statewide, we support 140 million trips, either on the fixed route buses you see in your communities or on the dollar ride, kind of demand responsive services. And so, digging into why this is important for the people we work for, the constituents in our communities, this is really important for low income individuals trying to get to healthcare, to work, and then also for um, people who just want other options to get to work. And of course, seniors and people with disabilities who have no other means to get places. So looking at some stats, 40% of households with really low income, 14,000 or less a year, utilize transit at least once a week. So this is um, an important service that our roadways, our transportation system can provide to those families. Also, you see a huge growth in transit, and probably more so with all the House Bill 2017 transit projects rolling out. Um, we've seen paratransit, and those are trips for seniors and people with disabilities with virtually no other means, quadrupling since 1990. And I don't know if you've heard of the, the senior tsunami. Uh, maybe that's a planning term. Um, but that might just increase over time as our families age, our parents age. Um, but this is also not just that um, cohort, but transit ridership overall in the state has um, grown twice as fast as the population during that same time period. So people are, are wanting more options. So, good thing transit is here as a resource, similar to the ATLs, you've got your RTCs. Um, so I'll introduce myself in a minute. I'm one of those RTCs that hopes to be a resource for you. So I sit within, well I sit in Bend, but I report to Salem. Um, 
in the uh, work within the Rail and Public Transit Division, headed up by Hal Gard, and my supervisor is Marsha Hoskins, the transit uh, section manager. I've listed a couple other key staff folks that you might want to write down. I know, Tana, you work a lot with probably Andrew and the, the fiscal guy. He's a great resource. Um, and I want to focus today mostly on the last bullet point, the regional transit coordinators. So similar to the ATLs, we are scattered around the state. And our role is similar but different to the ATLs. We are a liaison to transit agencies. I breeze through give you some numbers of the agencies that we work with, the diversity of agencies. We are on the road a lot, as some of you may know who work with us. We're developing close relationships, and we hope to use that, um, bring that as to your, your table as a resource and um, improving coordination with transit agencies or districts when um, there's that transit nexus in your project. We act as grant managers. Um, unlike the ATLs who have their local pot of funds, our pot of funds sits in Salem, and um, there are either formula or discretionary biennial grant programs where the funds are um, provided directly to the transit providers, and then we act as grant managers watching for deliverables and providing reimbursement. And I think key to you in this process is we can be a great technical resource in addition to a liaison. We collectively as RTCs have a wide range and breadth of knowledge. A lot of us have worked as planners, either with cities and counties, or MPOs. A couple of us, have, not myself, but have actually managed transit districts or services, and so they have really strong nuts and bolts knowledge. So I'm looking at Frank out in Central Oregon and Jason, they both manage transit services. Mark, myself, uh, we worked as planners previously, and Jennifer actually managed um, disaster management and parks and rec, so she brings a really cool perspective as well. And Arla has just the depth of knowledge in all things transit. She's been with our section for quite a while. And so to introduce myself, um, prior, and to kind of give an example of the experience we bring to the table, prior to being in this role, I managed the Albany Area MPO. So I have knowledge in the STIP process, the MTIP. I helped develop a regional transportation plan. I'm looking at Franny, she was in some of those meetings. Um, and so this is, we bring different um, perspectives to the table that I hope would be helpful for project delivery. And here's, um, Examples of a couple of the types of grants that we do manage. It's not just operations, wheels on the ground, but it's infrastructure, building transit facilities, bus stops, um, sidewalks when adjacent to bus stops, maybe crosswalks, we should talk later. <laughs> um, but there are opportunities as long as you coordinate early on so you can get things queued up for our discretionary funding programs. Okay, so let's get into the bulk of it. I think I'm okay on time. Um, so since I am very new to this process, I'm learning. Um, you'll see my next few slides are very sequential in what I've learned about the project delivery process and where I think the key touch points are. So please be patient with me. Uh, my goal here I'm, is to learn more and just start a dialogue. <laughs> um, so here are some touch points that I think RTCs specifically can be a resource for you all. So first, in um, plans, a project should be in a plan in order to be programmed and funded, right? And you probably know that the plans are generally long-term, pretty high level. So if you're an engineer, you're like, I want specs. I want to know where these bus stops are, what size, and what kind of pole. These are things I'm learning that you want. <laughs> and so um, if RTCs are engaged in helping to build these plans, and we know that's what you want from us, maybe we can say, hey, uh, Mike over at Basin Transit, why don't you design a standard spec for your bus stops? And that way, when Bill's like, what's your spec? I can just give it to him. And I know you probably got that from Mike anyway. But um, those are the sorts of things that um, maybe we can help build from the ground up to make your jobs easier. The next phase is competitive processes. And I know you usually think about STIP here, but I wanted to focus on what transit funding we can bring to the table and you all can leverage. I'm gonna to flip to my notes page because there are some numbers here I wanna read off. So by 2020, considering the new House Bill 2017 stiff funding, it is estimated that there'll be over 1.1 billion in total annual investment in transit around the state. And 154.2 uh, million of that is from state resources. 
So that's funds that you might be able to leverage with coordination and with not just the transit section, but the local provider to bring that to your projects for transit specific improvements. So from the pie charts, you can see the transit section manages a variety of federal state funding. Um, the green, that's local funding, district funding, other funding that we don't have control over in the fares as well. But we can influence or partner with agencies to think up projects for the blue and the purple pot. No, the blue and the, the red. Um, so early coordination, we can sit down, work with the transit provider to identify those key stops along a corridor that you will be working on that they want to improve stops um, and work with them to apply for a discretionary program to access those funds. In scoping, RTCs, and this is one role that I've played is just to flag um, transit relevant projects this early on in the process. Um, yeah, there's a route that, a transit route that runs here, there's a bus stop, just flag it for future reference to um, just keep track of it. But that's also time to, uh, if the RTC is at the table, we can put our eyes on this bus stop and ask, um, similar to what Jessica was talking about earlier, do people run across the street here after they um, get off their bus? Is it a safety issue? Is it ADA compliant? Or is there a stoplight just up ahead? And I'm imagining that this is an ODOT roadway, it's probably not, but just imagine that it is. Would it be helpful to coordinate with the local transit provider to move that stop to after the light and in tandem with some transit signal prioritization um, Everyone in the system can be a winner. Let that bus get through the stop and then stop at the far side and then the traffic can queue up at the light. In the meantime, the bus can board, unboard their passengers and then traffic can flow on. So that could be a system optimization opportunity and also a great boon for transit as well. I know transit signals can be pricey, but start thinking creatively and uh, who knows, maybe there'll be some transit money to support you in, in getting those improvements. And um, as I was doing my project delivery crash course, I learned about the scope values. And um, so you can look at this quarter if you're doing a theoretical project on it. How can we, um, how can this project make this quarter safer for transit, for riders, drivers, um, people who might interact with the transit vehicle? And what is the role of transit in this quarter? And also I talked about the optimization piece. All right, and this is a key takeaway for you too. Um, this is from the highway design manual on what a transit stop should look like. So um, eight by five foot ADA pad so that the person in a mobility device can get off the transit vehicle and maneuver around. And then also does the bus that operates in the area have two doors? And then does that mean you need two of these ADA landing pads? So hopefully this is a useful tool for you when you have conversations down the road with your regional transit coordinator. And also, if you had a shelter to that site, what does that change about the specs? Oops. So project selection, I think this means stiff, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll breeze through this one a little bit, but still keeping that flag going about is transit relevant to this project? and have you looked into leveraging transit funds, coordinating with the RTC? Uh, one thing I did forget to mention about um, federal authority versus FDA requirements, historically some Enhance and Connect projects have transferred over to the transit section for delivery, and this was part of an intermodal leadership team effort during the STIP 15-18 cycle, um, or the, that was the Dallas Transit Center, actually, that was shifted over for delivery. So. That's not really relevant to this conversation today, but if that is an option, if you're funding a tra large transit facility, would it make sense to move delivery to the transit section? And this is, um, there are a couple of key points I want to make on the project initiation slide here. Um, actions that you can take as project leaders, including the RTC on the resource list, I mean, engage them from the beginning and getting their input early on. So um, 
we don't come knocking on your door later and say, hey, you know, there's a bus stop there, and it's kind of late in the game. Would we be a good fit for the project team if it's relevant? And I think I, one thing I really need to stress is the RTCs play a different role and have different capacity in each region based on what projects we're working on. So this is a really a local conversation for you to have in region as a project leader with your RTC about how would they best engage in your projects. Um, but it could be sitting on the project team or it could be something less formal. And then of course, if the project doesn't have a transit impact, we'll probably let you know and go on with the other work that we're doing. Um, one thing I've, I've learned is right away is really key to talk about early on. And that's probably obvious to all of you, but that was a good learning for me. If, um, if, it, if we wanna build out some bus stops or make them ADA compliant, so what kind of right away do we need to make that happen? Even if it's a couple of feet, we gotta start talking about that early, I've learned. And lastly, thinking about that picture of the 197 bridge, even if there's no bus stop there, um, maybe it'd be good to engage that transit provider in the public engagement process so they know that they're gonna have to reroute their service, notify their riders that there will be some changes or impacts. So that's a small thing, but it can have a really big and good impact on transit, that, that bit of coordination. All right, DAP. So um, the DAP narrative is key too, and there's the section, the bike ped transit section. That's a good opportunity for coordination with the ATL to get that information to you. Um, so that's the key piece that I think the RTCs can help out with, but then I've um, put bullet points for some other components of that where um, we may have relevant ideas input for you. All right, by here I hope we're done. I hope we've given our input. Um, preliminary plans, I feel like that's the hard stop. That's too late. I see some eyebrows that's probably I'm on point with that one. So I'm gonna breeze through this slide. Hopefully we've done all of our coordination at that point. Um, key takeaways, coordinate locally with your RTC. Similar to Jessica saying, meet up with your ATL, see how you can coordinate. Please do the same with your RTC and see what that engagement can look like on your projects, depending on how you manage them and what the RTC's capacity is in your region. Key things that the RTC can do to help, flag projects when they're um, before the STIP, input on the DAP narrative, and also on the resource list, the mandatory or required resources list. Um, those are key touch points where we can hopefully provide some input. And also the leverage opportunities. So a lot of our funds are, uh, most of our funds are delivered on a biennial basis, so two years. Some of them, most of them are formula, but we have a big chunk of discretionary funding. So getting those conversations going early about local priorities that sync up with your roadway projects and how to get some discretionary applications rolling to, so you can leverage them for your efforts. And also, one thing that we learned through the House Bill 2017 process was that the public really supports public transportation. They passed this, or we have this payroll tax now to support transit. And um, this could be something that really makes your project a stronger multimodal project that's supported by the community. Even if it is just improving a few bus stops, it can make a difference. All right, well thank you for sticking with me at, it's probably five now almost. Um, we might have a minute or two for questions. We, we, yeah, we have um, a minute or two, absolutely. Any questions for Teresa? That means you covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, thank you, yeah, thank you again. Really appreciate it.